السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Most gracious, most merciful Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen All praise is indeed due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Lord of the worlds وأصلي وأسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all and to bless every single one of us and to grant us goodness and ease. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, it is important that whenever we do something, we do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever we engage in community activity, we should make sure it is beneficial to the broader community within the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should never do things in order to divide the community, in order to split the community, in order to cause a problem or issues. We should never do things with a bad intention. We should always have a brilliant intention reaching out to people, the Muslimin as well as the non-Muslims. We reach out to them in a beautiful way. If it is something to do with the Muslim Ummah, it's important for us to ensure that we try our best to be as collective as possible, to try and gather together as many people in order to achieve this goodness. And this is when we will be able to get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not easy to bring together communities. It's not easy to bring together even family members. It is not easy to unite people. It is very, very easy to break them apart and to disunite them. And this is why there is a greater reward to bring people together, to take your time, even if it means you took five or 10 years to bring people together, but your struggle was in that direction, perhaps your reward may be Jannah. And this is why those who divide and split and separate people or the hearts or communities for them is a severe punishment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May He protect us. May He grant us the ability to realize that not everything will be happening according to the way we want it to happen. Perhaps it might happen according to the way other people would like it to happen sometimes. I cannot be selfish with my opinion at times. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Yes, if it is a matter of halal and haram, I am entitled to stick to what I have said because I know I don't want to displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But small matters regarding the window and the door and some other little issues, sometimes we create big problems uh, with those petty matters. Now, a lesson that we have drawn from the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa there were a group of hypocrites that the, this group of hypocrites, they were very jealous of the number of Muslims that were strong. Those who were growing with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You have the likes of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, radiyallahu anhum. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon all of them. May Allah be pleased with them and with us too. These were the strong of the lot. These were the highest. But there were others who were new. They were weak. They did not know too much. So you have the hypocrites who always wanted to talk to them, to tell them, you know what, you don't need to follow. You know what? You don't need to do this. You know what? It's not important and so on. They needed a base. They didn't have a base because people were based it at the Prophet's Masjid known as Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi. They were also based at Masjid Quba, which was the first masjid built in Islam. And there was no place where these hypocrites could actually sit comfortably and try to brainwash or con people. So they decided to do something. What was it? This narration is made mention of in Tafsir al-Tabari, also by Ibn al-Mundhir, Ibn Abi Hatim, Ibn Mardawai, al-Bayhaqi, the narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, And he says these hypocrites decided to build a masjid, very close to Masjid Quba. So Masjid Quba, it was the first masjid built in Islam. Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam participated in building the masjid. It has a very high status and virtue in Islam. And right near it, they decided to put up another structure. And they needed an excuse because people were wondering how come so close proximity, what's going on here? So they decided to come to Muhammad sallallahu in order to legitimize the building. And they said, oh messenger, we are inviting you to come and read salah here. So at least if you read salah here, it's a house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And before the question is asked why it was done, we'd like you to know that, you know, there are some elderly people, they can't make it to Masjid Quba. Bearing in mind it was round the corner, subhanAllah. They can't make it to Masjid Quba. There are some who are sickly, there are the elderly, there are those in need. 
sometimes it's a very cold night. It's not easy to come all the way to Quba. Sometimes it's going to be raining. So in order to create that convenience, we decided to build this masjid. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa told them that, okay, let's see, I am going out to the battle of Tabuk right now. But on my way back, perhaps I will stop by. I'm going out to Tabuk. On my way back, perhaps I will stop by. And these people were all excited now because they knew we're going to get Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He's going to legitimize the structure. And thereafter, we can do what we want. We don't even need him to come thereafter. We will be sitting and so on. We'll be dividing the Muslims. We'll be winning back those who are weak, those who used to fight Islam just recently. Now that they've come towards Islam, we'll get them back. And this was their intention. So when the Prophet ﷺ was returning from Tabuk after the expedition, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses exposing this whole issue of this so-called masjid that was built. Verse number 107 of Surah Tawbah was revealed. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مَسْجِدًا ضِرَارًا وَكُفْرًا وَتَفْرِيقًا بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَإِرْصَادًا لِمَنْ حَارَبَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَلَا يَحْلِفُنَّ إِنْ أَرَدْنَا إِلَّا الْحُسْنَى وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّهُمْ لَكَاذِبُونَ As for those who have taken up the masjid in order to harm the Muslims, dirar means to harm, kufr means for disbelief, tafriq means to disunite, this was their intention. They wanted to harm, they wanted to cause disbelief, and they wanted to disunite the Muslim Ummah. And they were waiting in ambush for those who perhaps may have been fighting very recently, and they had just converted recently to Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they will promise an oath that their intentions were clean. When you ask them, why did you do it? They will say, no, our intentions were clean. This is the house of Allah. Wallahi, we promise you, the intention is clean. And Allah says, Allah bears witness that they are liars. So they were exposed. Shocking exposure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says in the very next verse, لا تقم فيه أبدا Don't ever go and stand in that place. Never. Don't go and stand there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the verses continue where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was then instructed or told that their structure is full of doubt and it will drop with them into the fire of Jahannam. He instructed Malik ibn Dukhshum radiallahu an with Ma'd ibn Adi radiallahu an together with Wahshi radiallahu an to go to that place and destroy the building. He said, break it down, burn it, let it be destroyed. It was a little structure and it was destroyed and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made an example of it. These verses were revealed and they are read by us today again. More important than anything else is how it applies to my life and yours. Like I said at the beginning, when you do something, do it for the sake of Allah. Ask yourself a million times, am I doing it for name, for fame, for popularity, in order to divide? Is it going to create huge problems and so on? If it is, perhaps you might want to revisit your intention. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us unite the ummah. Yes, if something is needed and necessary, and you have two groups of people, one discouraging you and one encouraging you, perhaps you might want to study it from various angles and see the need. Sometimes they are short-sighted people who do not see the need of a huge structure when it is actually needed. So there is a very uh, difficult situation that we find ourselves in sometimes striking the balance. However, it is wrong for us to point a finger at a structure that is there today and declare that we know the intentions of these people and this is known as Masjid Dirar. This is a masjid that has been built in order to harm the Ummah. We cannot say that. Yes, we may want to learn a lesson. But to pass a judgment is something else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand. A lot of the times we have a shortage of masajid. We actually have a shortage of places of worship. And there are so many nations and countries, they are skeptical to allow the Muslimin to build masajid. Although the Muslims are being increasing in number, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us fulfill our salah. What's the point, my brothers and sisters, of having a beautiful house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but no one goes there? We don't attend it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to attend. May He help us to become regular so that we can be from amongst those whom the hadith speaks about. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ A person whose heart is stuck to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So thereafter, Allah says in verse number 108, something very interesting. That masjid that was built first upon piety, it is more deserving that you stand in that particular masjid. In it, there are people who love cleanliness. They love to cleanse themselves. And Allah loves those who are clean. Which masjid is being spoken about? According to all the Mufassireen, Masjid Quba. That masjid, Masjid Quba, it is better for you to go there and stand in it than to come to this place here. And it is better for you to stand in Masjid Quba, where there are people who love cleanliness and purity. So there is a narration in Sunan Abi Dawood, Sunan At-Tirmidhi, Sunan uh, Ibn Majah, of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, as well as another narration also in Sunan ibn Majah of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, Jabir radiallahu anhu, and Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. They speak of the question of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when this verse was revealed. He asked the people of Quba, Allah has praised you and Allah has called you those who love cleanliness. What is it that you are doing different? Very interesting question. What is it that you are doing? And that is when they made it clear that they use water thoroughly in order to cleanse after using the loo, known as istinja. So after using the loo, the Muslimin, we don't just use tissue or we don't just use some sandpaper and continue. No, we actually use water in order to clean ourselves. And we are happy and proud to declare that it is one of the ways of combating diseases such as cholera and so on. It is a very, very important point in Islam. The issue of tahara and cleanliness has been given so much importance. Here is the verse. Allah says, He loves those who are clean, smart, those who are always prim and prop. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May He grant us and may, may He grant us the ability to be from amongst those who are not only clean externally, but our hearts also need to be clean, my brothers and sisters. You know, when you read, you read the narration, speaking of cleanliness being a part and a portion of your faith, People think it means I keep my hands clean, my face is clean, everything is smart, I'm smelling good. But your heart is dirty, your mind is dirty, your dealings are dirty, your relationships are dirty, everything else is filthy. We need to clean the mind, clean the heart, clean your business deals, clean everything. Then you are called a clean mu'min, a believer. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us beautiful cleanliness inside and out. Amen. So it was a very interesting, beautiful point that we learned from the people of Quba. And Allah praised them. They also speak of the wudu and how often they used to make it and how they used to take their time in making the wudu and the ghusl. Ghusl meaning the wudu is the ablution. And ghusl meaning the bathing, the bath that is required by a mu'min, how they used to engage in it. You take water, you don't waste it, but you make sure you are clean. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Wallahi, we are the most fortunate, gifted ummah. The ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we've actually been taught how to cleanse after using the loo. And that is considered a great act of worship. Subhanallah. Amazing. Amazing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Other religions might be ashamed of talking about this. But in Islam, it's one of the first things you learn once you accept the deen. Listen, you better use water. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and grant us goodness and ease. Amen. Then we have another incident that occurred that really was close to the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had an uncle known as Abu Talib. This Abu Talib was a very, very good man. To be honest, he looked after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from an early age. And he made sure people did not harm Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he made sure that people did not harm Islam and they didn't speak bad about Islam. And so one day he was on his deathbed. This hadith is muttafaqun alayh. It is upon the highest level of authenticity. So he was on his deathbed. And the Prophet ﷺ desperately wanted him to accept Islam. Because he was such a good man. You know, you see some really good people. And in your heart you think, the only thing this person's lacking is the shahada. The only thing this person's lacking is a kalima on their tongues. And subhanallah, it's not in our hands. We can only try, can't we? But the rest is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Muhammad sallallahu he sees his uncle on his deathbed. Around him are the cronies of Quraysh. They did not want to leave him. They used to know. He was also one of the senior people. So Abu Jahl was near him and a few others. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept repeating something to his uncle. What was the statement? He says, Ya, um, oh my uncle, 
قُلْ كَلِمَةً أُحَاجُّ لَكَ بِهَا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Oh my uncle, say one statement. I will bear witness. I will fight your case on the day of judgment. I want you to utter one statement. I will fight the rest. Subhanallah. Powerful statement at the end of your life. The hadith says, مَنْ كَانَ آخِرُ كَلَامِهِ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever's final statements as they are leaving this world is, there is none worthy of worship besides Allah, Allah will grant them Jannah. May Allah grant us that beautiful statement as we are leaving this dunya. So based on this, the Prophet ﷺ is telling him, say the statement and I will bear witness for you on the day of judgment. And the uncle is now being told by Abu Jahl, hey, be careful. أَتَرْغَبُ عَمْ مِلَّةِ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ are you going to turn away from the religion of your father, Abdul Muttalib? You want to turn away from the religion of your father? So this man was confused between the two. And he really, although Muhammad ﷺ kept repeating this, these people kept repeating it. And at the end, he fell for the people of Quraysh. And he was, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us. He denied the statement and he died upon kufr according to this hadith which is muttafaqun alayhi. So Abu Talib, what happened to him? He did not utter the shahada. And this grieved Muhammad sallallahu He wanted, he really wanted to ask for the forgiveness for this man. And he says, I will ask Allah for forgiveness for this uncle of mine. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses. Verse number 113, 114 of Surah At-Tawbah. <laughs> It is not befitting for the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the believers to make dua or to pray for the forgiveness of one of these polytheists or disbelievers who've died on kufr. And you know that this person is now gone and they've died and chosen kufr, etc. They have chosen for themselves that they will go into jahim known as the punishment. So one might ask, why can I not make dua for someone who chose not to worship Allah? The answer is quite simple. And it's very, very logical if you think of it. People feel it's wrong. So what? This person says, my parents were not Muslim. They chose, they were Satanists or they were atheists. Why can I not, after their death, make dua for their forgiveness? Let's stop for a minute and explain. During the life, you make dua for them, for their guidance, for their health, for everything you want for them because they are alive. But after they've died on kufr, you leave everything to Allah. Why do you leave it to Allah? They chose a path. They didn't listen to you. They chose the path. Their game is over. Their story is gone. The examination papers handed in and they walked out of the hall. It's over. They cannot come back anymore. Now what happened is up to them. No matter how much you go to the invigilator and say, please, you know, those answers, you know, my, my, my brother wrote the wrong answers. Please, can you? No way. The paper's gone. It's over. The exam is done. If they were in the hall, they could still change the answers. They are no, no longer in the hall. So what happens is, what is the point when your son has sworn a school teacher. Whose fault is it? It's your son's fault. You go up to the teacher and you say, I'm sorry. But your son says, I'm not sorry. Who's the fool? You are the fool. But if your son says, I'm sorry, and then you say, oh, my teacher, or oh, teacher, or oh, headmaster, whoever it is, can you please forgive my son? They'll say, no problem. The son is remorseful. He's welcome back at school. He won't do it again. And here we are. But if the son is on a page where he does not want it, he will keep on swearing. He's not remorseful. No regret. He's not apologizing. Guess what? Your apology is a waste of time. That's what it is. So the same applies to this. We are apologizing for someone who does not want to apologize. Allah says, stop insulting me. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. It's a serious matter in the deen. It's something big. People don't know. But here, Allah is admonishing or telling Muhammad Wasallam and the believers that look, you don't make dua for him. Leave him alone now. It's over. And Ibrahim salam in the past said the same about his father. And Allah says, immediately after that, verse number 114. That 
Ibrahim alayhi salam seeking of forgiveness for his father was only with a certain condition. Once he knew that his father was already from the people of hellfire, he then disassociated himself from that. So let's learn this beautiful lesson. I hope I've clarified it because many people feel why is it that the Prophet sallallahu said this and why is it that Allah does not allow us to make dua for the mushriks or the kuffar who've already passed away for their maghfirah. Before I move on, if someone you know from among the disbelievers have passed away, you're allowed to express your condolences, you're allowed to sympathize, you're allowed to assist in a certain way, perhaps sometimes with burial and so on, but you're not allowed to participate in religious activity, number one, which is contrary to Islam. Number two, this issue of istighfar, because it is clear in the Quran. These are the two main things you need to know. Sometimes people, who their parents have passed away, they happen to be non-Muslim. You may be the only son, you might have to finance the whole burial. You may have to, because you are the son, you are the child, but you will not participate in that which is haram. And at the same time, for you to bury a fellow human being is an act of worship, no matter who they are. It is fardu kifaya. It is actually compulsory upon a number of people who are enough to bury that particular person, even if they're not Muslim. I wonder if we knew this because they are human beings. The same applies if I were to die and there were no Muslims around, it would be only humane for those who are around to, to help to bury. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding of humanity. Sometimes we use religion wrongly in order to distance ourselves from something that is humanitarian, something that is common logic. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and protect us. Another thing, those whose parents and families are all Muslim sometimes will never ever understand what those whose families are all non-Muslim are going through. So be careful before you open your mouth. Learn and listen and understand and seek knowledge and then you will guide. It is difficult. It's only when you've mixed with people and you know and you've seen what they're going through that you will be able to offer them the correct guidance. Sometimes you don't know. You are giving them a ruling based on your life and that's not right. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand these deep and beautiful rulings of Islam. Like we always say, take cue from the ulama. There are so many ulama in our midst, make use of them. Ask them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open our doors. Now we have one of the most interesting stories in the entire book known as Asbab al Nuzul. You know, the reasons of revelation. For me, this is the most riveting story and I will spend inshallah the next 10 minutes with this beautiful story. The battle of Tabuk took place. Everyone was supposed to go out. There were certain people who remained behind because they were sick and ill. They were given an excuse. We spoke about it yesterday. There were certain people who remained behind because they were hypocrites and they didn't want to go. And we spoke about how they presented excuses that were rejected by Muhammad Sallallahu But we will come to the exact statement of Muhammad Sallallahu in a few minutes. But there were three people who stayed behind they were good people, but they were lazy. Only laziness. It's known as at taswif. Taswif means sofa, sofa, sofa. You know, I will do it, I will do it, I will do it, and you don't end up doing it. I will go for salah, I will go for salah. Before you know it, salah is over. I'm going to turn before the end of Ramadan, before the end of Ramadan, before you know it, it's already Eid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. It's a reality. So don't do that. Shaitan's first way of grabbing hold of us is to make us delay. That delay is shaitan's trap. Don't be entrapped. Don't waste time. You want to turn to Allah, do it now. N-O-W. The minute you say, okay, as soon as tomorrow morning, I'm going to start. That tomorrow morning is already diluted. By the time you walk out of the masjid, everything is diluted. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to change now. I mean, so Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu was one of those three who he says, I was busy with my things and I said, okay, I'm going to prepare. I was preparing a little bit. I said, okay, I'm going to prepare. I'll go out. I'll go out. He says, I didn't ever stay away from the battles of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa besides the battle of Badr. And that was also a story. But here I didn't mean to stay. Before I knew it, the army was gone. The army was gone. And I said, okay, I'll catch up with them. But before I knew it, I said, now you know what? It's too late. It's hot. And you know, how am I going to catch up with them? And I was just waiting with the people. So this hadith is muttafaq alayh upon the highest level of authenticity. Ka'b ibn Malik himself is narrating the hadith. He says, you know what? When I started looking in Medina, I only saw people whom I knew were either sick and ill, they had an excuse, or others whom we knew these were some hypocrites. So I was like an odd one out, man. And I was feeling, hey, what's going on? So when the Prophet ﷺ got to Tabuk, he asked about Ka'b ibn Malik. He said, where's Ka'b ibn Malik? Because he missed him. He was a good man. So the people told him, oh, you know, this man, he's, he stayed behind and some people said a few bad things. So Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu said, no, don't say anything bad. We don't know him as a bad person. So let's not utter any words of evil. So later on, uh, Ka'b ibn Malik says, I'll never forget Mu'ad because of his defense of mine when it was more needed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So he says, 
when they came back from Tabuk, as they were coming back, hypocrites were starting to plan what excuses they're going to give. And I'm starting to think, what excuse am I going to give? Because now I had no excuse. And the battle of Tabuk, you know, they had a successful mission. And they were coming back. And uh, he says, I didn't know what to do. And I was just asking around and people were having different comments, say this and say that. But in my heart, I said, I can't lie. I cannot lie to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I cannot lie. So he says, when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came back, I was watching. And I saw him, he came calm, he entered the masjid, he read two rakat of salah, and he was sitting so calm and relaxed. And people started coming to him with all excuses. Ja al muadirun. You know, those people who wanted, one comes, he says, Oh Messenger, you know, I had a problem, my wife. And Oh Messenger, I had a problem, you know, my business. Oh Messenger, I had a problem, you know, I had a sore, whatever, here and there. Everything, excuse in the book was mentioned. The Prophet Wasallam, these hypocrites were 80 plus, just over 80. And what he did, he said, look, for me, it's okay. Allah knows what's in your heart. Which means he excused them over and above. Meaning, you know, outwardly excused. But inside what's happening in your heart, I leave that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's made salam. He greeted him. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam greeted him back. But he had a smirk, a smile. And Ka'b ibn Malik says, I knew he was upset. And he says, what about you? Why did you stay away? Ka'b ibn Malik says, Wallahi, O Messenger, if it was anyone besides you, I would have presented an excuse. But there is no point in me lying and making you happy when Allah is not happy. There is no point in me lying and making you happy when Allah may expose me. So he says, I want to be honest. I was the strongest and the wealthiest at the time. I was lazy and I didn't come. I have no excuse. Ka'b ibn Malik, so honest. The Prophet ﷺ says, okay, get up, walk out until Allah reveals verses or until Allah gives us some decision in your regard. He was shocked. Get up and walk out, out, gone. Ka'b ibn Malik, literally, he got up, he started walking. So some of the people of Banu Salama, they walked behind him and they said, hey, we've never known you to have sinned. What you do, go back and just present any excuse. Look, he's accepting everybody's excuses. Just make up something and go. You cannot be a person who's rejected from the majlis and from the, the uh, you know, gathering of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Go back. He says, I almost went back and I wanted to lie, but I told myself, no ways. I'm not going to tell a lie. I don't want to lie. I cannot lie in this regard. It was something extremely serious. And you're lying to whom? To Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he says, I asked him, do you know of any other people who are same like me? You know, anyone else who the same thing happened to? They said, yes, there are two others. Hilal ibn Umayyah, the old man, radiallahu an, and Murara ibn Rabi'ah, radiallahu an, another man. Exactly the same thing you are saying, that's what happened to them. So he said, oh, you know, now he's got company. There are three of them, not just one. But they had participated in the battle of Badr, which means they were serious Muslims. They were... You know, they were top notch. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May He grant us a resurrection with the people of Badr. Say Ameen. So the Prophet ﷺ, when he was faced with all these three, the, the ruling was the same. Ignore these people. There came a time when these people came with their excuses. The same thing happened. And after some time, the Prophet ﷺ told his companions, do not speak to them. Allah has told us to literally boycott these people. No speaking, no greeting, no responding, no nothing. So... They were very, very, very touched, hurt, should I say. The two of them, Hilal ibn Umayyah, Murara ibn Rabi' radiallahu anhumah, they stayed at home and they were crying and crying and making dua, asking Allah's forgiveness. And they, they didn't even understand, you know, like we say in our terminology, you don't know whether you're coming or you're going. Subhanallah. As for Ka'b, he says, I was young, the youngest of the lot. I used to go to the masjid and I used to intentionally greet people. Assalamu alaikum. No reply. I used to go to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Assalamu Alaikum. And he didn't even look in my direction. I used to try and see his lips. Are they moving? No movement. He says, I used to. The most beloved to me, look at the test. Look how they want to achieve forgiveness. Look at how dedicated they are. Look at how they committed the sin. Now they want forgiveness. They're ready to do anything in order to please Allah and His Messenger for their mistake. So now, Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu says, you know what? I went through. And I tried again and nothing happened. And in the marketplaces, no one's greeting me. He says, I had a cousin of mine very close to me by the name of Abu Qatada radiallahu anh, and he had a little 
garden and I jumped the wall into and I saw him and I said, Assalamu alaikum, you know, thinking, oh, at least now it's just me and you. He turned away. I was shocked. I was hurt. I felt that, look, what's going on? And he says, after some time, the king of Ghassan sent a messenger to Medina Munawwara with a letter. Remember, this is Hadith Muttafaq Alayh. It's an authentic Hadith. He sent a letter with one of the business people. When they came to Medina, they said, we are looking for a man known as Ka'b ibn Malik. When they found me, they gave me the letter. The letter said, the king of Ghassan is telling, has heard about how your people have boycotted you and is offering you asylum. And you come there and we will look after you. He says, I, I had hatred for this letter. I took it and threw it into the fire. I didn't, it didn't even touch me. How? People are trying to use your moment of softness to try and con you into leaving your whole Islam and your deen. It might happen to some people during your difficult days. Other people will come to you and try and convince you what you're worshipping is wrong. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whom you are worshipping. It's Allah's test. So he says, uh, I threw it away. 40 days later, 40 days later, message got to our wives to say, you need to separate from your husbands. That was very, very heavy. So the wife of Hilal ibn Umayyah comes to Muhammad and says, Oh messenger, the man is old. He can't even do his things on his own. I'm just serving him. He's had no physical relationship with me since the day this has happened. He's not even into, he's just sitting, crying, engaging in tawbah, istighfar, whatever else, 40 days have gone. Can't you give me permission to actually just stay with him? So permission was granted to her because as it is, there was no physical relationship. The other two, some of the people of Banu Salama went to uh, Ka'b ibn Malik and they told him, why don't you also go and get an excuse for your wife? Look, she was excused. I'm sure yours will be excused. He says, no ways, not at all. I'm not going to go. So later on, according to this narration, 50 days later, he says, I read Salatul Fajr. How many days later? 50 days later. And they were making dua and crying and so much had happened. He says, I made Salatul Fajr and I was sitting at the top of one of the houses, the rooftop. And I heard from the top of Jabal Sila. Jabal Sila is one of the mounts of Medina Munawwara. And he says, I heard someone loudly saying, Ya Kaab, Abshir, good news, Kaab, good news, Kaab. And he says, immediately I fell prostrate. I made a sajda to I knew that this is, this is it. I knew that Allah has forgiven us. And I fell prostrate. I said, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. In the meantime, verses were revealed to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, forgiving these people. Verse number 118 of Surah At-Tawbah, together with the previous verse 117, where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Allah has forgiven the believers and, you know, those who participated in the battle of Tabuk and so on. And Allah says, وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا and Allah has also forgiven those three who presented their excuses, who were actually, who had remained behind. Those three who had remained behind. The term khullifu refers to those who remained behind. One of two things. Those who did not present excuses with the rest of the hypocrites. They were three. There was an exception. They came with the truth. So they were behind in the sense that they were not from among the hypocrites. And also those who did not participate in the battle of Tabuk. So he says, immediately that man came rushing to me. I came running down the mount. I shook a hand for the first time in so many days. It felt like it was not normal. Subhanallah. Imagine you're shaking somebody's hand for the first time after so long. And he says, I gave this man part of my clothing. It was the system at the time where you take off your clothing and you give it to them. And he says, then I didn't have something proper to wear. I want to go into the masjid. I quickly bought some clothing. I borrowed some clothing. I wore it and I rushed into the masjid. As I'm going, people are giving me good news, giving me good news. They want to hug me. Little armies of people congratulating me, telling me, wow, you know, mashallah, you, you have finally been cleared, finally been cleared. And he says, Subhanallah, I went into Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I saw him sitting in the masjid and I noticed around him were people. Talha ibn Ubaidillah radiallahu anhu, he got up to congratulate me. No one else got up. But when I saw Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I smiled at him and I greeted him and I got a response, Subhanallah. And he says, I saw his face lit up as though it was a piece of a moon. Kana idha surra istanara wajhuhu ka'annahu qita'atu qamar. Whenever he was happy, his face started shining as though it was a piece of the moon. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, I saw he was deeply happy. And he says, Oh Kaab, I want to give you good news of the best day that has passed your life from the moment your mother gave birth to you. 
So he says, O oh Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is it from you or from Allah? Which means the forgiveness, are you just going to tell it to me? Or is there a verse that came down? Wow, because if there's a verse, wow, they're going to be reading it up to the Day of Judgment. Subhanallah. So he says it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he gave the news and this man was so excited. He says, oh messenger, during my days of my dua, I promise that when I am forgiven, I'm going to donate all my money for charity. That's it. You know, so the messenger says, hang on, keep some money, keep some of the money, give away some and keep some. So anyway, he gave some of that, that wealth and he says, subhanallah, Allah had forgiven us after such a long time. And these verses were revealed. He says, had I told a lie, what would have happened? Had I told a lie initially, perhaps the messenger, I would have just been from among the hypocrites. And he says, after that, to the day I died. And the day he made mention of the narration. He says, I haven't told a single lie, not even by error. And Allah has tested me so much where things have come to me. It was simple to get out of it with a lie, but I didn't lie. It kept on happening up to this day. He says, and inshallah, up to the day I die. My brothers and sisters, that was a beautiful lesson, inshallah. Tomorrow, perhaps we'll go through some of what we benefited from this beautiful story. But one thing for sure, be dedicated. When you ask Allah, keep on asking Him. The reason why this happened is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show us that you will achieve forgiveness. Sometimes it's a period of time before you get what you want. Remain dedicated, remain steadfast. Allah knows, Allah is watching. He has a bigger picture. He has something bigger in store for you. Never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi subhanaka Allahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Tanastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Tanastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Tanastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Tanastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.